be afraid when you call my name You say you are my witnesses, yeah Chosen from beginning of time Had me always on your mind Brought me out from the dark into the light I don't have much to offer But my life's laid on the altar I won't live now for myself So here I am with empty hands I'm ready now with your command My, 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 my soul It's all I have to choose Even when I don't understand But living is uncertainties But God is feeling every need Keep holding if you just believe With faith of a mustard seed We can move mountains, yeah If you believe I believe, I believe, I believe Things will fall into its place There's no doubt that you Are always coming through Yeah Even times I feel alone You say don't let me go Take hold, I'll make it known I don't have much to offer But you're walking me through waters I don't have to be afraid So here I am with empty hands I'm ready now at your command My, 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 my soul It's all I have, it's yours Even when I don't understand Ooh. Believing in uncertainties But God is doing everything Keep hoping you just believe with faith of a mustard seed We can move mountains, yeah If you believe If you believe it Past life, I had to leave it Good life, I can't achieve it Confidence in God, man, I ain't conceited I swear I must be dreaming Mayweather jab, the devil keeps swinging Praying hard, the only way I'm scheming People point at church, is that Theo singing? That's what God do I should have died times two Looked up to God and said I got you And it goes on and on, Erica Badu All I have is one wish Hope my prayers are longer than my sin list I panned out just like Chicago Deep Dish Moving forward because I don't have much to offer But my life laid on the altar I won't live now for myself So here I'm ready now at your command My heart, my mind, my soul It's all I have, it's yours Even when I don't understand Believing has uncertainties My God is filling every need Keep holding if you just believe With faith of a mustard seed We can move mountains, yeah
Marchando. Marchando en la luz de Dios. 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 Marchando, siempre marchando. Marchando en la luz. La luz de Dios. Marchando. Siempre marchando, marchando en la luz de Dios, cantando 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 en la luz de Dios, cantando, siempre cantando, cantando en la luz, la luz de Dios, cantando. Siempre cantando, cantando en la luz de Dios, orando 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 en la luz de Dios, orando, siempre orando, orando en la luz, la luz de Dios, orando. Siempre orando, orando en la luz de Dios, amando en la luz de Dios, amando en la luz de Dios, amando en la luz de Dios, orando en la luz de Dios, amando, siempre amando, orando en la luz, la luz de Dios, orando. Siempre orando, orando en la luz de Dios, bautizando 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 en la luz de Dios, 
Batizando, siempre batizando, batizando en la luz, la luz de Dios, batizando, siempre batizando, batizando en la luz de Dios, batizando en la luz de Dios, batizando en la luz de Dios. Welcome to the I Believe Northern American Missions Conference. You've just entered the Hall of Faith. Take a look around. Who are we? We are the PAC World Sector. What do we stand for? Proclaiming always Christ's kingdom. Where can you find this pack family? Throughout the Midwest. Throughout the Pacific Northwest. In Canada. believe in being a people of God's Word. We believe in restoring Biblical Christianity. We believe in calling everyone to the standard. every lost soul. We believe in mercy and in grace. We believe in giving everyone a second chance. How can you become a part of this family? by being a sold-out, baptized disciple of Jesus, willing to give up everything and go anywhere and do anything for Christ. This is the pack. You're about to witness what God has done in the pack family of churches in the year 2020.
Well, good morning, PAC family. My name is Mike Underhill, and this is my incredibly beautiful wife, Brittany Underhill. And uh, we are the leaders of the newly planted Minneapolis St. Paul International Christian Church. I know that this has been an incredible conference for all of us so far. We've gotten to hear so many different lessons from disciples all over the PAC world sector, as well as even from around the world. I know that I've been so moved from a lot of the lessons. So the purpose of the conference has been to get our faith ready for this new year, the year of mountain moving faith. And I wanted to read a scripture from Mark 11, verse 23. It says, truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself in the sea and does not doubt in their hearts, but believes that what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Now I know that we've heard this scripture already, but God has incredible things in store and it takes your mountain moving faith just to see God's plan come true. So I'm so excited to be someone who casts off anything that hinders my faith, my doubt, all these things that just get in the way of 2021 being the year that God has envisioned for our new movements. And Brittany and I are so excited to be even more faith-filled, not only after all the incredible lessons we've heard from so many incredible leaders around the world, but today we get to hear John Causey preach the word this morning. I hope you're ready. So right now, Brittany and I want to proclaim, I believe. I believe. I, I believe. believe. Let's say it all together. I, I believe. believe. And let's do it one more time. I, I believe. believe. Well, without further ado, welcome, welcome to, to the, the Northern, Northern American, American Missions Conference, Conference Sunday, Sunday Service. Service. Good morning, PAC family of churches. Let's pray for our service today. God, we are so grateful for the kingdom. Thank you for uh, calling us out of the world, God, calling us to be disciples in your kingdom here on earth, God. God, we are so grateful for the, the PAC family of churches, for every disciple here today, part of this amazing Northern America Missions Conference. God, we thank you for John and Emma Causey and their powerful leadership of, of these great churches, God, that are, are seeking and saving the lost just like uh, Jesus did when he was here on earth, God. Father, I pray that we are grateful for this responsibility you've entrusted us with. God, I pray this weekend the conference inspires us, God, that it calls us higher, Father, that we will come out of this with great zeal, with great passion for you, to do the work that you set before us, God, to, uh, to save souls, to evangelize the world in this generation. God, I pray that uh, what we hear, what we see will move us powerfully. God, we are uh, grateful to be disciples in your kingdom. We love you. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And now it's time for the announcements. My name is Aaron Turner. This is my awesome, incredible wife, Sheila Turner. And we have just a couple pieces of announcements for you. The first one is that we just want to take the time to congratulate Rich and Hannah Hardy because they were appointed as an evangelist and women's ministry leader in God's special kingdom. The second announcement is that just in a little bit, we're gonna see the appointment of Theo and Leslie Dawson, who will be appointed as a shepherd in God's kingdom. All right. Also on January 13th, from 10 a.m. to 12 p.m. Central Standard Time, we are going to be having the first ever virtual global ICCM master student meeting. And we would like every master student to attend. Come on. The last announcement we have for you guys, we want to encourage you to please, please, please stick around because we're going to see at the end of service some souls added to God's kingdom from all our family of churches in the PAC world sector. Amen. We love you guys. Next up is the GNN Good News Network. Hello and Happy New Year. Thank you for tuning in to Episode 5 of GNN, our Global Good News Network, the greatest news you'll ever see. I'm Luke Speckman, and this is my amazing wife, Brandon. We're reporting to you from New York City. Family, 2021 is here, and last year, as stated in Haggai 2, God shook the nations, and Satan tried to get the glory by bringing about fear, division, and destruction. But amidst all the uncertainty, God's glory was able to shine bright through His unshakable kingdom. And we are excited to see all the amazing things in store for this coming year. And with that in mind, the beginning of January is so exciting as winter workshops are happening worldwide. The year of 2021 is the year of mountain moving faith. Each church in every world sector will be gathering to sing, 
hear the word preached, pray, and unite together with mountain moving faith. So exciting. Let's start by recapping some of the miracles of 2020. One of the great highlights from last year was the virtual World Missions Jubilee entitled Visions and Dreams. Thousands were able to come together virtually and hear incredible lessons around the globe. We witnessed the inspiring appointments from the PAC RIM and Sages World Sectors as Jorge and Valeria Castillo and Nick and Dale Infantino were appointed as evangelists and women's ministry leaders. It was also amazing to have the largest graduating class yet for the International College of Christian Ministries. Most notable was Raul Moreno's Sunday sermon where he pointed to the sky, quoting his father saying, I want to go to heaven. Following this monumental online conference, we then made the shift from the decade-long Good News email to the Good News Network, which has expanded our reach and influence tremendously as we've moved to a virtual world. A few months into the fall, we saw the completion of nine church plantings, Amsterdam, Netherlands, Bujumbura, Burundi, Campinas, Brazil, Guam, Calcutta, India, Minneapolis, Minnesota, Salt Lake City, Utah, TNT, which is Tallahassee, Florida, and Thomasville, Georgia, and Tucson, Arizona. And of course, another huge congratulations to John and Emma Kazi, who were recently appointed our PAC World Sector leaders, giving us our 12th World Sector. Kingdom-wide, God protected our fellowship from COVID-related deaths for much of the year until December. However, we have all been affected by this virus and send our deepest condolences to the family members and close friends who have passed away. Yet through this tragedy, there were also miracles we saw, God's healing power in the lives of the disciples. And as many know, especially in our dear sister, Shivanti Crawford from the New York City Church. Now a little bit about Shivanti. Shivanti spent 62 days on a ventilator, 30 days in an induced coma, and 21 additional days in a rehabilitation center learning how to walk again. She was then sent home in stable condition with oxygen and a walker. Yet despite nearly losing her life, she was used by God to give spiritual life. Not even vocal cord paralysis has stopped her from continuously sharing her faith with her nurses and the doctors who treated her. And God did not let her words fall on deaf ears. While in rehab, Shivanti shared her faith once again with her hospital roommate, Erica. Months after Shivy's release, Erica studied the Bible, was baptized in December, and is now our sister. They were battle buddies against COVID, and now they get to be spiritual battle buddies against Satan. Shivanti, we are so inspired by your un wavering faith and your perseverance to bear fruit during a time of crisis and fear. You are a hero. Since our last GNN episode, we have experienced the difficult loss of two of our brothers due to COVID-19 complications. Reuben Teemer, the father of our sister Dara Teemer, was the first baptism of the Atlanta church. He lived in Atlanta and Dara went on the mission team in the hopes of winning her father to Christ. It was such a joy to see Reuben baptized because of Dara's bold faith to save her family. His conversion is an encouragement to us all as we continue to pray for our family members. The second brother who went on to glory is Mark Hare. He was the dynamic song leader of the New York City Church and the newlywed to his beautiful wife, Paula. We are saddened by their unexpected departure, but we rejoice because they passed away as faithful disciples of Jesus. And for that, we celebrate them going on to glory. I like to imagine Mark leading the angels in song with our God in heaven. After a brief commercial break, 
We'll head over to Paris to hear from Guillaume what a day in the life of a disciple is like for him. Greetings from the ICCM or the International College of Christian Ministries. We are a university that helps train and equip future leaders to accomplish the Great Commission in our generation. We are accredited to provide bachelor's, master's, and doctorate degrees in ministry, charitable services, administration, and shepherding. Excitingly, we now have 19 extension campuses, including Abidjan, Atlanta, Boston, Chicago, Columbus, Johannesburg, Lagos, Los Angeles, London, Manila, Miami, New York City, San Diego, San Francisco, Sao Paulo, Seattle, Sydney, Toronto, and Washington, D.C. Excitingly, this year we also have 17 students currently striving for their master's degrees and an astonishing five postgraduate students working on their doctorates. Please keep the ICCM in your prayers as we fight to raise up the next generation of leaders in God's kingdom. Paris is really a great city. So it's a city with a, a great history, with a really beautiful architecture. People have some fear about religion too. Uh, they have some bad examples and they stay focused on bad examples and um, scientific spirit, a lot of scientific mind stop people because people think, yeah, we can explain everything by uh, by uh, scientific reasoning. But when we ask them what is the meaning of your life, they don't know what to answer. They don't know what to answer. They are like shocked, like, I never think about this. <laughs> I don't know what's the meaning of my life. I grew up in a non-religious family and uh, I was an atheist and um, for me it was hard because there was a lot of problems in my family and uh, I had a lack of direction and a lack of uh, example in my life. Uh, I, would, I tried to find happiness, to find joy uh, in many things. For me the idea of God is like I was not really thinking about God, I was just distracted and uh, I went through immor immorality, I went through alcohol, to drugs. Uh, it was working for a moment, but the day after it was worse. And uh, I started uh, by uh, being depressed. So I started to pray a lot. I started to read the Bible a lot, to meet some pastors. I spent time with a lot of people, uh, so-called Christian. And uh, I went in, uh, in, even I went in Africa to seek God because I went two weeks there just to, because I, I had some friends there and uh, they were very um, involved in the mission. Uh, I met a disciple, so it's Kevin, Kevin Laken Toto from the Church of Paris, one of my best friends now. Finally, I decided really, really to, to submit to God because I really saw the truth in the scriptures. And not only in the scriptures, but really like uh, true disciples, uh, how they love me. So this is really what impacted me and I decided to, to be baptized yeah, the 2 December 2018. Ouf. Ok. 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 Most of people here in Paris, they seem very busy. They run everywhere, but in fact, they don't know where they go, really. Uh, and they don't really have direction. This is why uh, we are here, because uh, we are here to help them, of course. And uh, But at the same time, people are very receptive when you come to them, when you start to talk with them. Uh, you see that people, they, they, they start to open very quickly. For me, I was really challenged by uh, by Anthony, my disciple and the leader of the, the evangelist of the Paris Church, because he challenged me to to love uh, friends uh, more than him. And I was seeing him like, okay, he comes from USA, he learns French, uh, he, he give up everything from from uh, Fr from USA to come in France. He came with his wife. Uh, Cassidy almost who is uh, American too and it's like okay yeah th th this guy loves more friends than me because he had radical actions and in fact most of people in France uh, their dream is to leave friends and uh, most of people of friends don't love friends and uh, I don't want to be that kind of uh, that type of person yeah, I want, I want to save uh, French people, uh, to save my people and to make a lot of disciples. 
And our dream is to, it's to fill Stade de France. Stade de France is the biggest stadium we have here in France, and it's 80,000 people. And it's a, it's a crazy dream. It seems maybe impossible like this. It seems a lot, but uh, yeah, with faith, everything is possible, and God can do uh, more that we can ask or imagine. Thank you so much for sharing your life with us, Guillaume. We send our love to you, Anthony, Cassidy, and the entire Paris Church. Now, in the same way that mountains rise above the surrounding land, our vision for world evangelism must rise above any obstacle that may come, including COVID-19. The theme for 2021 is the year of mountain moving faith. And with this extraordinary faith, we are laying before our God 12 new church plantings. Lord willing, we will see the following USA cities planted. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, Boise, Idaho, Providence, Rhode Island, Detroit, Michigan, Tuscaloosa, Alabama, and St. Louis, Missouri. In addition to the USA churches, we are excited to plant churches in Bagao City, Philippines, Yaoundé, Cameroon, Brazzaville, Congo, Edinburgh, Scotland, Lisbon, Portugal, and Colombo, Sri Lanka. Now this would mean four new countries planted. That would take us from 47 to 51 countries and territories and giving us 122 churches worldwide. And it would also mean six new states within the USA, totaling 30 of the 50 states. Truly 2021 will be a year of mountain moving faith as we witness what God does. We have watched God work movement-wide through all of the excellent virtual church services, conferences, and Women's Days, and even our historic World Missions Jubilee. You did not miss a beat in making sure the gospel had an avenue to reach every year through the invisible continent of the internet. Now, speaking of using the invisible continent, Lucy Mejia and the women in the Mexico City Church boldly cross many continents in their Women's Day titled Conectadas, which means connected. So from South America to North America to Europe, women from all over the world tuned in to be inspired, encouraged, and connected. Great job, Lucy. Now moving forward, we are excited to see the continued use of virtual services as COVID remains a major concern. Let's continue to stay safe as we worship God with all of our hearts to save souls for our Lord. Some important events to look out for and some dates to keep in mind. The Northern America Missions Conference is happening this weekend virtually from January 8th through January 10th. The Hawaiian Islands Missions Conference will be meeting in person in Hilo, Hawaii from January 22nd through the 24th. The South American Missions Conference will be February 26th through the 28th in Sao Paulo, Brazil. The Eurasian Missions Conference is also in person in Kiev, Ukraine from April 30th through May 2nd. And our second virtual World Missions Jubilee is happening Thursday, August 5th through Sunday, August 8th. Be sure to mark your calendars. Now, as a movement, we are currently at 8,000 322 disciples worldwide, and our mantra for this year is 10,000 for the Lord. In the year of mountain moving faith, I know we will see even greater things like Jesus promised would happen in John 14, 12. As we pray for these great miracles, let us also pray for the newest spike in COVID-19 cases around the world, as well as those in our fellowship who have tested positive. Please pray for Blaise Fumba, Victor Gonzalez Sr., and Daniel Escobedo. And please also keep our dear brother Chris Klopek in your prayers. He is now on day 37 in the hospital, and he recently received treatment for a heart condition. He also continues physical and occupational therapy every day. I'd like to share a video from the Sages New Year workshop. Chris preached a powerful lesson from his hospital room. The combination of his personal example and what he preached left all of us speechless. Matthew 7, 24 says, Therefore, anyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the wind blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone 
who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against the house, and it fell with a great crash. These two people Jesus compares at the end of the Sermon on the Mount have several points in common. They both build, they both hear Jesus' teachings, and they both experience the same set of circumstances in lives. The difference between them isn't a lack of knowledge, but that one ignores Jesus' words. Externally, their lives may look similar, but with lasting structural differences, this will be revealed by the storms in their life. Right now, this is the greatest storm of my life, fighting to be able to walk again. And I can only say praise God for 26 years of consistently going to God. And now I have enough faith to weather this storm because you got to remember, God's not going to give you more than you can handle. He's a loving God. So if you think you've got more than you can handle, it's not true. God has given you the resources in his word to really be strong enough to endure the pain and, 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 and the hurt and the disappointment and the, the fight to not get hopeless, but be hopeful. So I just want to encourage you guys as we go into 2020, let's continue to show people that we are the men and women of God who dream and let them see God in your lives. Don't be fake. Let them see you weak. Let them see you cry. Let them see you in pain, but let them always see you overcoming and fighting and always ending up being obedient and vulnerable and humble. This will show people that God is among us. Wow. That was incredible. If you would like to watch Chris's message in its entirety, please visit the Metro Miami ICC YouTube channel and go to the men's session. Family, please continue praying for his complete recovery, as well as strength for his wife, Sonia, their children, Chase and Cassidy, and the entire Orlando church. We love you so much, Chris. We hope you enjoyed today's episode with a recap of 2020, learning about the esteemed International College of Christian Ministry, a day in the life of a disciple in Paris, and a look forward into the year ahead with future church plantings and missions conferences. If you haven't done so already, please subscribe to our channel. For daily updates, you can follow us on Instagram. And we are looking forward to seeing you next month. This is Luke and Brandon Speckman reporting to you from the Good News Network, the best news you will ever see. Hello, my name is Chris Adams, and this is my lovely wife, Carrie Sue. We're so excited to be serving as shepherds in the Chicago National Christian Church, as well as the Pack World Sector. And it's our incredible honor to appoint as congregational shepherds for Chicago Church, Theo and Leslie Dawson. Yay! And we're uh, very, very excited for you guys. Um, you know, 1 Peter 5, verse 1 is a great scripture that reminds us of you. Both to the elders among you, I appeal as a fellow elder and a witness of Christ's sufferings, who also will share in the glory to be revealed. Be shepherds of God's flock that is under your care, watching over them, not because you must, but because you are willing. And uh, I would like my wife to share this time for Leslie. Oh, Leslie, my dear friend, you have such a willing heart to serve. Mm -hmm. 
Wow, your your heart to serve lets you speak the truth in love to everyone as if they were your own children. And I love the way that you have cared for so many and have brought so many to Christ this this year, this mm-hmm. past year. I respect you so much. I am so grateful for your humility and the way that you've helped many, many women trust God this year. I love you. Theo, you know, when we got here to Chicago with... Uh what we don't call the supplemental mission team anymore. Um, you are so incredibly solid in your faith. Mm-hmm. And I think it's one thing to be willing, but it's another thing to stay willing. And for nearly three decades, you and Leslie have stayed willing. You've been in the fight. You've helped people to stay faithful and uh, and, and really protected the, the church in a powerful way. You know, you've both been great examples of helping your kids become Christians. Amen. And by your example in your life, they love God to such, such an incredible extent. They would like to share some thoughts with you at this time. So I give you Lamar and Eliana, Tia and Cornell, Theo and Summer. Hello, everybody. My name is Lamar Dawson. This is my beautiful girlfriend, Eliana Elias. We have the pleasure of sharing about my parents' appointment today. Um, the scripture that comes to mind to me right off the bat is First Timothy 3, verse 5. It says, if anyone does not know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? And man, mom and dad, you guys have inspired so many with your lives, with our family. And it's just a testament to your leadership. You guys are a parent and a faith to so many. It's true. You guys it completely embodied this scripture. Um, you've impacted a lot of people in a big way. And we're so excited to see this new chapter play out. Um, we're so inspired. As Lamar said, we love you guys a lot. Hello, everyone. My name is Cornell Buckner. And this is my amazing wife, Tia Buckner. And we're here to honor some very special people to us. Our parents, Theo and Leslie Dawson. We did want to start off with a scripture which is found in Acts 20, verse 28. And it reads, Keep watch over yourselves and all of the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he brought with his own blood. I'm going to allow my beautiful wife to share. Yes. Mom and dad, um, this has been a long time coming. And when I read this scripture, you guys embody this. It says, watch over yourselves, right? It says, be overseers of the flock. And I believe that this has been your heart for your last 27 years and walking with God. You just care about God's people so much. And you, you've been parents to so many people. And I'm honored to be able to share you guys with God's church. And I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud of all the things that you've done in the honor and for God's glory. And I love you very much. We thank you guys so much for all you've done in our lives and within the South region. We love you guys dearly. Congratulations. Congratulations. Love from the Buckners. Hey, I'm Theo Dawson, and this is my amazing girlfriend, Summer White. And we have the privilege to share and honor an amazing couple in the kingdom of God who are shepherds. And today they're going to be congregational shepherds and appointed in front of all of you. And so we would like to share a scripture that makes me think about this amazing couple, my parents. And it's first John chapter five, verse four. It says, for everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith. And when I think about that, I think about your faith because your faith has helped me. It's pushed me to be the man of God that I needed to be and how I responded to the scriptures and just to see your lives and how you've impacted our entire family. And so I'm super grateful for you guys. I'm excited to see you guys appointed and I'm going to let Summer share. Yes, Theo and Leslie, I love you all so very much. You guys have been so supportive in my own walk with God. And thank you so much for being superheroes in the faith to me and many others in the church. You guys are definitely pillars for the Chicago International Christian Church. And I just want to say congratulations again. I love you guys dearly. On behalf of John Namikaze and the Chicago Shepherds, we present to you the Shepherds Teardrop, which represents all the tears you've shed and will shed in the future to protect God's people. Amen. Thank you, Chris and Carrie Sue. This is so awesome. 
You know, I think about this and I was thinking, man, when it comes to serving God's people, it is an honor. And there's a scripture that comes to mind. Luke 17, 10. It says, so you also, when you have done everything you were told to do, should say, we are unworthy servants. We have only done our duty. And I first want to thank God so much because he believed in us. And if God didn't believe in us, we would not be here. And there's a couple of people I definitely want to thank so much. The parlors and the shellbracks in the very beginning who saw us as shepherd material, which is awesome. And I want to thank the Blackwells for appointing us as shepherds. And definitely I want to thank the Kazis, John and Emma Kazi, for appointing us today. And Aaron and Sheila, who we work side by side with here in Chicago. We love you guys so much. We thank you so much. And I'm going to let my wife share. Hello, everyone. It is such an honor to be here in front of our packed church family. Yep. So excited. Thank you so much for today appointing us as Congregation of Shepherds. Mm -hmm. uh, glory be to God. We know through God all things are possible. Yep. He has determined a time and place for everything. And we are mm -hmm. so in awe of him. Yes, and we're so excited. Everything that God is going to continue to do in our family and churches. Thank you so much for this opportunity. And one thing I think about and I want to leave you guys with is that we have only We've done, done our, our duty. duty. We love, love you, you so guys. much. And thank you for this honor. Yes. Thank you so much. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for Theo and Leslie. God, uh, they've meant so much to so many here in the church in Chicago. We are so grateful for how much they love you and how much they love your church and protect your church and really hold to the deep truths of the faith. Mm -hmm. Father, we're honored to serve side by side with them, with all the Chicago shepherds. And uh, Father, I pray that you bless their ministries. Bless us. Bless our unity, Father. And uh, help us all to, to raise up more and more shepherds across the whole kingdom, Father. We love you with all of our hearts. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. This is my beautiful wife, Chanel. My name's Mike. We have the privilege of serving the Boston International Christian Church, and we are honored to be with the PAC World Sector this morning. I believe what an inspirational theme for this conference going into the year of mountain moving faith. I'm reminded of, as we take communion this morning, the limitless power of God. You know, the cross is limitless in its power. You think about it, and you think about a passage even in Revelation chapter 13, verse 8. It talks about that the Lamb of God was slain before the creation of the world. You go, Mike, no, he wasn't. He was slain 2,000 years ago during the Roman Empire. Well, the Bible says that the cross has limitless power, that the Lamb of God was slain before the creation of the world, meaning that Jesus died, yes, in our time frame 2,000 years ago, but it had effects for everyone that lived previously to him and everyone that would live after him. He is a limitless God. And today as we take communion this morning, the bread that is his broken body and the juice that is his blood that was poured out for us, Chanel and I want to share about the limitless power of God. You know, in Mark chapter 9, I'm reminded of a story. If you'll Turn there with me, please. This will be our text for our communion this morning. Mark chapter 9 and verse 21, we pick up in the middle of an encounter that Jesus is having with a demon-possessed boy. And it says in verse 21, Jesus asked the boy's father, how long has he been like this? From childhood, he answered. It has often thrown him into the fire or water to kill him. But if you can do anything, take pity on us and help us. If you can, said Jesus. Everything is possible for the one who believes. Immediately, the boy's father exclaimed, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. Imagine having a son, a child. You know, we just had our daughter, um, gosh, now over a year ago. And I couldn't imagine an evil spirit throwing her into the fire or the water to kill her from childhood. And the boy's father goes, can you help us? If you can, do something, Jesus. And Jesus goes, if you can? Everything is possible for him who believes. Now, this is what's interesting. The man cries out, I do believe. Help me overcome my unbelief. 
And so we get insight from the Holy Spirit here that we can believe, but even our belief can have limitations to it. You know, as we consider 2021, we want to have a faith that God can truly move mountains, but it's going to take removing all of our limited beliefs. And something Chanel and I learned last year as we think about the power of the cross was to remove our limited thinking and our faith. You know, sometimes as Christians, we just have limited beliefs. It actually comes out in what we say, for from the overflow of the heart, the mouth speaks. We say things like, bro, I've got this guy studying the Bible, but he has a non-Christian girlfriend, implying that it's going to be more challenging for him to become a disciple. Instead of going, our God is so massive and so big and has no limits, the gospel is powerful enough and the cross is powerful enough to help him to be able to give up everything to become a Christian. We go, you don't understand, it's COVID-19, there's no one on campus, so I guess we just can't do campus ministry. (laughs) Go, no, our God has no limits. God can figure out a way. You know, at this time, I'm going to have my beautiful wife share about different things that we've had, where we had limiting beliefs, where the cross of Christ helped us see the power of God to remove those limits, to say, I do believe, help me overcome our unbelief, amen. Amen. So with last year, looking back, uh, it was definitely a year of wrestling, as it was for most of the world, but wrestling with so many different things, wrestling with limits on my faith. We moved to Boston um, in December of 2019, and when we got to come back, we came back full of faith, vision, 120 in 2020. That was our rallying cry. And, you know, we really believed God can do great things. But sometimes belief and unbelief can coexist, as the scripture shared with the Father, who says, help me overcome the bit of unbelief that's still in there. And coming into Boston, those were the things I definitely wrestled with. Coming back to a city that you've left, you wonder, have I changed? That was one of the biggest things I had to wrestle with was the the fear, the doubt, the shame, the anxiety of, am I different? Am I going to repeat the same mistakes or have I grown? Um, Seeing a church that's different. What we left and what we came back to was so different in that so many of our relationships had changed with people. Many had left and that was heartbreaking and many had been added who we now needed to know and to give our heart to. And so there was so much uh, stress in my heart about it. Um, there was also now coming to town with us a little baby, our little baby Bellamy. And, and as much of a blessing as she is, there was once again that, that fear again of can you do ministry and motherhood? Always worrying about that in my mind. How do I, how do I give my whole heart to my husband, to my women, to my church, to the lost, to the city of Boston, and to my child? Is she going to somehow miss out? Is she going to get less of me because of my role that God has given me? And, and that fear really stuck with me of, of how will I be effective for God and effective in my role as a wife and mother? I uh, think COVID-19, of course, that came out of nowhere, <laughs> but it brought with its own self all these fears. I had multiple family members that contracted the virus and were hospitalized, and I had to wrestle with, what if I lose them? Were there things I didn't say? Was there gospel that I didn't preach? Am I going to live with regrets? Is this going to change me? There were people in the church who also contracted the virus and were hospitalized. And when it came within the church, once the world pushing in came into the church, that's when I realized, okay, my limiting beliefs don't just affect me. My fear doesn't just affect me. My fear is contagious. It's just as contagious as this virus is. And it's going to infect everyone around me if I don't deal with it, if I don't wrestle with this and bring it to the cross. And so I'm grateful. I'm grateful that the cross has no limits, that there's incredible power in it, that the same power that raised Jesus from the dead, something that's absolutely impossible to do today, lives inside of me. That gave me such hope that, you know what, there are no limits on this. I'm so grateful. Uh, In our world sector, we had an emotional mastery class at the beginning of the year. And it really pushed us to ask this one question and to bring it to every situation. And it was, how is this, and fill in this with whatever's going on for you, the best thing that's ever happened to me? 
And that reframing, it changed my world. It gave me so much faith that, okay, whatever comes is from the hand of God. And it is the best thing for me. It's the best thing for my faith and for my convictions and everything that flows from that. And reframing things in that way helped me to tear down some of those limits, tear down some of those barriers where, yes, I believe God can do great things, but that nagging unbelief still exists. And so I am blown away by what God has done last Last year, I can't even imagine what he can do this year, but I know the word says he can do more than I can even imagine. And so I'm so excited for our year of mountain moving faith because I know that last year God stretched me. He changed me. He he transformed our, our lives, our ministry, our marriage, our church, our family. And so I'm so excited for what he's going to do now as we open up our faith to him because I know the only thing that can hold us back is our limiting beliefs, our limiting faith is the only barriers that we put on God. So thank you so much for letting me share. Thank you so much, babe. You know, as we take the bread that is his broken body and the juice that is his blood this morning, let us pray and consider what are the areas that I do believe, but there's limits to that belief. And let's cry out to Jesus, help me overcome my unbelief. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, this time this morning, God, where we get to reflect on the cross and to think about you, Father. The cross gives us hope. The cross, God, literally, Father, disarmed all the evil that's out there, God. Lord, you have triumphed over the devil. And God, we want to pray right now that as we uh, take communion, that Father God, we will eliminate all those nagging, limiting beliefs that hold us back from moving the mountains. And Father God, we love you with all of our hearts and we commit this time to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.
from the great Milwaukee Church. My name is Jay Shelbrack. This is my amazing wife, Barb. At this time, we're going to have the contribution message. Please open your Bibles to Luke chapter 19, starting in verse 1. Luke 19, verse 1. So Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but being a short man, he could not because of the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now, I give a half of my possessions to the poor. And if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the son of man uh, came to seek and save what was lost. We have a very interesting situation here. First, you got a guy by the name of Zacchaeus. He's a tax collector. Now, what we got to understand is that tax collectors at this time were pretty much hated because they were traitors. Uh, Rome controlled Jerusalem and Israel at this time. And what they did is they grabbed certain Jews to extract taxes from the rest of the Jews. And uh, so the, the Jews in general felt like these guys were traitors, and so they hated him. And so here you got Jesus coming along, and he looks up, and he sees Zacchaeus. And he says to him, come down now, and uh, I must stay at your house. I must come to your house. Now, people's response is they're ticked off at Jesus. They're like, man, you've gone to the house of this sinner and uh, but then you got Zacchaeus's response. He says, "Hey, look here now. If I have uh, cheated anybody on anything, I'm going to pay back four times the amount, and I'm going to give half my possessions to the poor." And Jesus' response is like, "Wow, today salvation has come 
to this man. And you look at what, what's going on here. Why did Zacchaeus respond this way? Now, we can kind of relate with Zacchaeus because he's wealthy. And we live in America. America is the land of wealth. And if you travel much, you, you, can, you, can, you can see that. And there's a tendency for us to cling to money. Uh, it, it becomes our God. And so what happens with Zacchaeus here is Jesus interacts and he says something to him. He says, I'm going to stay at your house today. And what that does is it provokes an immediate response out of Zacchaeus. Now, you got to look at, did Jesus say anything about money? He didn't. But Zacchaeus immediately responds in gratitude. Why? As far as I'm concerned, what's going on here is that Jesus is saying to Zacchaeus, listen, I want to become a part of your world. I'm going to come to your house today. And Zacchaeus probably has no friends. And for Jesus to do that, it broke him. The question is, what does it take for us to get broken of sin? Well, Zacchaeus' heart is super humble here, and he just responds in gratitude and in repentance. Now, you got to realize everybody there is probably thinking, four times a month, sign me up. And he's probably got this huge line of people waiting uh, to receive their money. But you look at the situation, you realize, man, what a radical change that Zacchaeus makes. All because Jesus singled him out and said, hey, I want to come into your world. Jesus has done the same for us. That here you got God in the flesh and he says, listen, I want to become a part of your world. And that should move us that someone as awesome and amazing wants to know us. Now, for the Milwaukee Church, one of the great strengths is our contribution. Uh, when we started the church, there were only two people on staff, Barb and I, and now we have 10 paid staff people. Why? Because what we do is when we make disciples, we rescue their hearts. We turn them around. We untangle them. We free them up of guilt, fear, anxiety, anger. And as a result, people give because they're grateful. Now, the other thing is that they see that the money is going right back into the church. And they, they're supporting it. And they're saying, hey, this is my church. And because of gratitude, people give. Now, we do our contribution messages, but we don't focus on just the contribution. We focus on the heart behind it, the faith and the gratitude of what God has done for us. I give you more. Thank you for letting us share today. I'm really grateful. I wanted to share that I grew up giving contribution uh, from a young age, actually through college. I gave contribution that was never an issue for me, even when I studied the Bible. But in the late 90s, um, we had been on staff in the Chicago Church in the International Church of Christ. And we had gotten off staff and we had moved to Madison. And this was a huge adjustment for us personally. Um, we started our own business. I went back to work full time. We had three children. But it was a huge change for us spiritually also. The International Church of Christ stopped holding to the standard of the Bible. Yep. And so, which was what the church was built on. And so we had to make a decision. And so in 2004... Our family left the church that was in Madison. Our faith was weakened, but we proceeded to start our own small group church. Um, and Jay wow. and I, with our three girls and my parents who were in their 80s and another couple started a small church. Um, there was no other church to go to. We weren't connected with anyone else. We just knew we couldn't stay where we had been. Um, we met on Sunday services in the community room, and Jay brought up to me, he says, we should be giving contribution. And I was so taken back at that moment because I was like, we don't have any expenses. You know, you're not being paid. We don't have, we, we meet in the community room. There's no other churches around us because we've given missions before. We knew what that was all about. Um, I was like, what do we do with our money? And Jay just said to me, it's part of our worship to God. Come on. It was like an aha moment for me at that time. 
Um, maybe I was super weak spiritually, which I really was. <laughs> I, I had lost hope in the church. Um, it was maybe a combination of just feeling all alone also. But he said, I give to God because of my worship. And we need to be grateful in all circumstances. And it was really hard for me at that moment to be grateful because I felt like I had lost everything that we had invested in. But my heart was changed. Amen. And we need, we started collecting our contribution. We collected it. Honestly, we set up an account for a few years. And then by that time, we had connected with Port Millen and um, Kip had vision for the Midwest. And he connected us with Syracuse. And in 2006, the, the Chicago church was planted in the new movement. And Syracuse funded the planting. Uh, they funded it with money and they funded it with people. And there was 29 people in all that came from different places over the, around the U.S. And Jay and I, with our girls, moved to Chicago. And we were so grateful to have a, a church home and a new place to worship and people that we were in the same faith with again, but we had collected a contribution over those years, and it was something that we could bring to the table for the, the mission team. It wasn't a lot. It wasn't going to fund the mission team, but we had something to bring, and it gave us, you know, just such great vision, and the church to us before that was invisible. We couldn't see it until we get, came together with the Chicago church and then started the church. And look what God has done. Come on. Uh, that was in 2006. Uh, he's done so many amazing things. And I don't think it's just because of our contribution. Uh -huh. But I do believe that it's because we decided to worship God in every area of our life. And give contribution was just one of them. And Zacchaeus, you know, he gave because he was motivated out of gratitude. And Jay helped me at that time when my I was weak spiritually to remember to be grateful. And we need to give Come to on. God, worship God from the heart, but also because we're grateful. Amen. With that, let's uh, let's pray. Dearly Father God, we're so very grateful uh, that you have blessed us, that you've given to us. And I pray that our hearts are hearts of gratitude, that we appreciate so much your sacrifice on the cross. And you've given us so many things. you put people in our lives. You've given us your Holy Spirit. And of course, the death of your son. I pray that our contribution today will be one of great joy and gratitude and that we honor you with all we do. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, everybody, we're about to sing our God is an awesome God. Amen. We're going to sing song 445 in our songbooks. We're going to have the sisters start us off. Amen. One, two, three. Our God is an awesome God He raised from heaven up a wisdom power in love Our God is an awesome God Our God is an awesome God He raised from heaven up a wisdom power in love Our God is an awesome God God, he reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns. Oh, God. 
God, our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with wisdom, power, and love. Our God is an awesome God. And what an amazing, I believe, conference we've had. My name is John Causey, and I have the opportunity to be able to preach the Word of God to you today. I want to start by talking about, I believe, the most important two words you'll ever say in your life. And those two words just happen to be the theme of our conference, I believe. Those are the most important words you can ever utter, but those are also the most important words that the God of the universe will ever want to hear from your lips. And I want to challenge us to say, I believe all year long in 2021, but not just all year long, but say it every month, say, I believe, say it every week, I believe, say it every day to God, I believe. Perhaps you might even want to say it every hour to let the, the Lord of the universe know that you are a true believer of his. The title of our lesson this morning is Nothing is Impossible with God. Amen. I mean, the, the, the possibilities of that are absolutely endless. Nothing is impossible with God. Imagine with me today, what would you do if nothing were impossible for you? If you were an I believe nothing is impossible for me, disciple, what would you be? How would your life look? How confident would you be on the job? How confident would you be in your daily life if you knew and you understood and, and, and you had come to a deep conviction in your spiritual life that as long as God is with you, nothing is impossible with God? Well, in fact, the Holy Scriptures actually teach that. that, that as long as we're with God, and as long as we have belief in God, all things are possible for us. We find here in Matthew chapter 17, please turn in your Holy Scriptures over there, a passage where some of Jesus' apostles were not able to perform a miracle. And then Jesus was actually able to perform that miracle. And they come back and they ask Jesus, why couldn't we do it? And here in Matthew 17 and verse 20, the Bible says, Jesus replied, because you have so little faith, because you have so little belief. In other words, belief or lack of belief can place limitations on what God is able to do in our lives. He goes on here, he says, truly I tell you, if you have faith as small as a mustard seed, you see, it doesn't take a lot of belief. It doesn't take a lot of faith. He says, if you just have a little bit of faith, you can say to a mountain, move from here to there, and it will move. But be careful as a disciple of being a believer with no belief. You know, sometimes we can fall into that trap where we can become a believer, but we don't have belief. We don't live the belief that God wants us to live in our lives. Interestingly enough, the first early Christians were, were, were called believers long before they were called Christians. In fact, their belief was so strong and so powerful and so palatable that, that the people in, in, in their cities said they're believers. They were known for their belief. It's so important to understand, though, that, that being a believer is not empty words. It's a promise that God wants to fulfill in your life spiritually with all the blessings and awesome things that comes with it. God truly desires for mountains to be moved in our lives. You know what's really interesting is 
you know, a lot of people believe and they, they think that all things are possible without God. And we'll look at Moses in just a minute, who actually believed that himself. He thought that he could deliver the people of God without God. You won't believe this, but don't do this now, but maybe later today or later tonight, go over to a wall in your house, stand up against that wall with your shoulders all the way up against the back of the wall, and then lift up, uh, and then actually take your right and your left foot and put both heels up against the back of the wall. So you've got your shoulders up against the wall, your heels are up against the wall, and then I want you to try to lift your left feet. Now you may be thinking as you ponder that thought right now, where you sit, that that's something you could easily do, but it's impossible. Try it a little bit later. Don't leave my sermon right now and go try it. Try it a little bit later, and what you'll see is that it's impossible. In other words, everything that you think is possible is not possible. You can't get to heaven without saying those words, I believe to Jesus. I don't care how nice you are. I don't care how friendly you are. It's impossible to please God without belief. As I mentioned earlier, be careful of being a believer with no belief. You know, the Bible is filled with wonder and all sorts of incredible verses that portray God making the impossible possible. Please write down Genesis chapter 18 and verse 14. You know, this happens when it comes to life and family. For, for Abraham and Sarah, God makes the impossible possible. In Genesis 18, verse 14, Samuel and, I'm sorry, Abraham and Sarah are waiting for a promised son. The Bible says that they're beyond childbearing age. In fact, it says that Sarah's womb is dead. There, there is no life in her womb. It is a physical impossibility for Sarah to have a son. But God says, you will have a son. And of course, Abraham at 100 years old and Sarah very old with a dead womb gives birth to a son. We find in Genesis 18 verse 14, the Bible says, is anything too difficult for God. We also find that God does the impossible when there are needs in our lives. You know, in Numbers chapter 11, verse 23, we won't turn there, but in Numbers 11 and verse 3, the, the Israelites are hungry. They've been in the desert. It's over 600 men, over a million people with women and children. And, and the Bible says that, that they were hungry and they were complaining against God that their needs weren't met. And the Bible says that God said, I'm going to meet that need. And yet Moses, their leader, was skeptical. And Moses wasn't sure of what God was going to do. And God responded to Moses by simply saying, is the Lord's power limited? I, I know there's a million people in the desert. I know there's no food out here in the desert. I know that there's no hope of food out here in the desert. I know that this is an impossible situation, but Moses is the Lord's power limited. And then God says, now you'll see whether my word is true or not. And then God rained down food from heaven. Well, another example of, of, of God doing the impossible is with Job, in Job chapter 42, in the area of trials and difficulties in our lives. Many of us today may have trials and difficulty in our lives, but let me tell you something. You haven't begun to have the trials and difficulties that Job had. And for 42 chapters, Job is challenged and he's decimated, not by God, but by Satan. And 
after 42 chapters, God turns everything around for Job. And Job simply said, you know, I now I know that you can do all things in verse 2. That no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Why? Because nothing is impossible with God. I heard a guy quote one time in one of my graduate courses in theology. He said, to those that believe, no explanation is necessary. But to those who do not believe, no explanation will suffice. Which one are you? Are you a believer who, who, where no explanation is necessary? Or are you a doubter where no explanation will suffice? You know, I want to give you two brief points today. Point number one, believe everything is possible with God. And then point number two, believe everything is possible for you through God. Look over in your Bibles to Exodus chapter two. Of course, in, in, in chapter two, Moses was born. God works a miracle and he spared and his mother puts him in the Nile and the daughter of Pharaoh scoops Moses up from the Nile and he's raised in the most prominent family in all of Egypt. He, he's an Egyptian prince. This slave boy becomes an Egyptian prince. That in and of itself was impossible but God did it anyway. Why? Because God had chosen that Moses would be the deliverer of his people. But Moses learns very early here in chapter two that in order to do God's work, you've got to have God. And Moses, on his own volition, decides that he is going to take the matters of God into his own hands. And Moses tried to become Moses before God made him Moses. And he attacks one of the Egyptian soldiers and he kills the Egyptian soldiers. And Moses, because he tried to do it his own way, has blood on his hands even before God begins to use him. And the Bible teaches us that it took Moses 40 years to overcome trying to be Moses without God. The people of God have been in slavery now for some 400 years. You say, well, how, how can a loving God leave his people in, in, in slavery and turmoil and bondage for 400 years? Well, you know, is, is, is that a loving God? Well, we find here in Exodus chapter 2, during that long period, in verse 23, the king of Egypt died, the Israelites groaned in their slavery, and they cried out, and their cry for help because of their slavery went up before God. God heard their groaning and he remembered his covenant with Abraham and with Isaac and with Jacob. And so God looked upon the Israelites and was concerned. And so they, they were in bondage for 400 years, but then they finally cry out to God. And immediately, one verse later, God meets that need. And we find here in chapter three, if you look there in verse nine, it says, and now the cry of the Israelites has reached me and I have seen the way of the Egyptians and how they are oppressing them. So now go, I am sending you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, up out of Egypt. And so they, they, they cried out in chapter two and immediately God responded. The Bible says here in, in uh in verse 13, and so Moses said to God, suppose I go to the Israelites and say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? Then what shall I tell them? And God said to Moses, I am who I am. This is what you are to say to the Israelites, I am who I am. And so earlier here, of course, uh, Moses is up on the mountain, and, and the bush is burning, and you know, this was common. Moses would have seen this a thousand times. He would have seen bushes burning in the brush on mountains. But this particular bush was burning and it didn't burn up. And, and, and this caught Moses' attention. 
And, and God used this, this bush to get Moses' attention, to draw Moses near to him. You know, I wonder what God is using to get your attention today. Maybe God has brought some difficulty in your life. Maybe there's something that's on fire in your life. It hasn't burnt up, but it's on fire. And God is using that to get your attention to draw you near to him. But God is not doing that just so that you could look at the burning bush in your life. You know, a lot of us are just looking at the burning bush in our lives and we're not acting on it. And God says, Moses, don't just look at the burning bush. Look at the burning bush and understand something. I'm calling you. The Moses that you wanted to be 40 years ago, I'm calling you to be that Moses now. But I want you to be that Moses my way. You know, are you just looking at the burning bush in your life? If you've been in Bible studies with people in this church and and, and you're going through the studies and, and you've gotten to the end and you know that it's time for you to get baptized and make Jesus Lord of your life and become that true believer and to utter those infamous two words, I believe, but you're just sitting there looking at the burning bush of your soul. I want to challenge you, stop looking at the burning bush and act on it and make Jesus Lord of your life and declare, I'm a believer. You know, it's so amazing that, that Moses says, well, who are you? Who, who am I to say who sent me? And God says, I am. And I don't know about you, but if I was Moses, I think, well, what kind of name is that? I am. I've never heard anybody have the name I am before. Why? Because I am is not a name. I am is not a name. It's a phrase. It's a phrase that says I am and includes what I am. I will be what I will be. Or, or as my grandmother would say, I bees what I bees. I am what I am. I will be what I will be. That which will be, I am. What is this? This is poetry. This is a poetic expression of the very nature of God. Pointing to God's eternal existence. This isn't a name. This is a phrase. This is a description. This is a poetic expression of God saying, I exist. And when we understand this, we now have the key to unlock belief like we never had before. Scholars say Jeremiah 33 verse three is God's telephone number because God simply says there, call me. It contains the promise, call me, the living God. You know, it's interesting here. Let's go back over to Exodus chapter four. We saw where Moses said, well, what, what if they don't, what if they don't, what if they don't believe me? What if they don't accept that I'm from you? Tell them I am sent you. And, and God spends the rest of the chapter trying to convince Moses of who he is. And then here in chapter 4, verse 1, the Bible says, Moses answered, what if they do not believe me or listen to me and say, the Lord did not appear to you? And here Moses still is questioning God, even though all things are possible with God. What if? What if? And God doesn't even respond to this question anymore. He simply says in verse two, the Lord said to him, what's in your hand? A staff, he replied. The Lord said, throw it on the ground. Moses threw it on the ground and it became a snake and he ran from it. I'm sure a lot of us would have run too if our staff had turned into a snake. How many of you are scared of snakes? I know all the sisters have their hands up right now. Snakes are scary, but he says he ran from it. Then the Lord said to him, reach out your hand, take it by the tail. And so Moses reached out and took a hold of the snake and it turned back into a staff in his hand. You know, the Bible says that the staff turned into a, a snake. 
that, that Moses says, God, I, I, don't, I don't believe anymore. What if they don't believe me? What if they, God didn't respond to that. You know, one of the things that I love about the Lord uh, so much, one of the greatest characteristics that I find in my relationship with God is that God is always willing to work with what I have. Isn't that true in your life as well? God is always willing to take you where you are and work with what you have, even if it's scary. The staff is on the ground, it turns into a snake. And the Bible says, Moses runs from it. We run when we're afraid, don't we? Uh, we may not even know we're running. You know, you're, you're watching this uh, sermon on, on Zoom today. If, if two or three people in your Zoom party stood up and just started running, what would you do? You'd get up and run too. You, you wouldn't know why you were running. You're just running because everybody else is running. You're not worried about why you're running. You're, you're just running. And, and when you get to safety, you'll find out why you were running. You're like, well, why were we running? Because fear makes you run, even if you don't even know all the reasons why you're running. And Moses here ran from God. You know, when you start running from one thing, you're going to keep running from everything. Some of you have been running for years in your life. You've been running from the calling of God in your life. You've been running from Bible studies. You've been running from the things that you need to change. You've been running and running and running and running and running. It's time to stop today. It's time to stop running from what looks like a snake. You know, it's interesting because Satan will make everything look like a snake. And so Moses' rod turns into a snake. The rod in Hebrew is a, a, a natural symbol of authority. It was a tool of, of shepherds that, that, that represented their leadership and their guardianship of the, she, of the sheep. Taking the rod uh, means carrying belie the belief of God and the authority and, and the, the guidance of God in your hands. It's carrying the power and and dependency of God to do the impossible in your hand. That's what that staff represented. There was nothing special in the staff. It, it was simply a, a long, straight piece of wood. It would have been like a long, straight branch that would have perhaps broken off of a, of a tree. And generally, they fashioned it so that there was a knot on the end or, or a hook on the end so that if the sheep got out of line, they could take it and, and reel that and pull that sheep back in but 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 having the staff was a symbol of belief that God would take care of you and so the rod turns into a snake and then in verse 4 the bible says that 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 God tells Moses this look in verse 4 he says then the lord said to him reach out your hand and take the snake by the tail what a command Moses was afraid of the snake and he ran and God called him back and he said, pick it up. Pick up what you are afraid of. You know, when I see this passage, what I realize is that I don't have to be afraid of anything as long as God is with me. You know, a lot of times in our spiritual lives, we don't know what we have until we just pick it up. It may look like a snake. Satan will make everything look like a snake to us spiritually. Satan has always tried to make good look like evil and evil look like good. God said, pick it up, take it by the tail. You know, sometimes God will call you to do things that you're scared to do. He'll call you to places where you're afraid to be. Just because you're afraid of it doesn't mean it's not what God wants you to do. You know, there are many that are scared to lead a Bible talk. I want to challenge you to lead a Bible talk. Some of you are afraid to share your faith. And I want to challenge you to, to pick up that fear. To share your faith. Tell people about Jesus every day. Sharing your faith isn't a snake. Sharing your faith is a rock. And I want to challenge you to share your faith. Let's share our faith in 2020 more, 2021 more than we ever have before. 
Our, our world is hurting. Our world is sick. People are depressed and discouraged in record number. There's more suicides being committed in our nation than ever before. Let's pick this snake up by the tail and help people find Jesus. I'm so excited about all the baby Christians just using their talents uh, in the kingdom of God. You know, I think about Antonio who got baptized and studied the Bible with his mom and she got baptized. He baptized a couple of his college friends and, and then he wrote a song and put it out on, on uh, YouTube entitled Freedom because he's been set free in Christ. I think about Jasmine Seals using her incredible singing gifts to inspire the kingdom. I think about Chassie. What an amazing voice. Chassie was just baptized and she's singing all of these songs now for God. Can you imagine how God feels to see Chassie now singing for him, using her talents for him? I think about Brian Denzi. Brian did this amazing Christmas song for us that literally he put it up, Chris uh, retweeted it to everybody and that song was all over the kingdom of God. And God was using Brian in an incredible way. I think about David and Katie at our Appreciation Sunday. They're artistic and so talented and they made these unbelievable cups to encourage disciples throughout the South using their talents for God. You know, we've got to pick up what we have, you know, and, and until you pick it up, you don't know what you have. And I want to challenge us to pick up our talents and use our talents for God so that God can, in fact, do the impossible through us. You know, Satan is always trying to turn us into a snake, turn us away from our belief. But let's make sure we believe and know that all things are possible with God. Point number two, believe nothing is impossible for us. Matthew 21 and verse 22. In verse 21, the Bible says, Jesus, Jesus replied, truly, I tell you, if you have faith and do not doubt, not only can you do what has been done to this fig tree, but you can also say to this mountain, go and throw yourself in the sea and it will be done. If you believe, you will receive whatever you ask for in prayer. You know, he says nothing will be impossible for those. You know, my prayer is that we are numbered with the those, that we are that those that he's talking about in this passage that are disciples. There are two parts to making all things possible with God for us. Number one, you've got to pray and ask for things. He says, if, if you pray, you, you, you got to pray and you've got to ask. But then secondly, you've also got to believe. It takes both. Praying by itself does not work alone. Praying without believing accomplishes nothing. We know that from Matthew 13, verse 58, where it says Jesus could do no miracles in that town because of their unbelief. We've got to pray and we've got to believe in order for the impossible to take place in our lives. How many of you have ever heard the phrase that you need to take a leap of faith? You know, the leap of faith idea comes from the trapeze artists, who if you go to a carnival, they're standing high at the top of the tent, and, and there's a guy in, in one side way up high, there's another guy on the other side way up high, but you don't see the guy, you're just looking at this guy going back and forth on the swing. And he's way up high and there's no net and, and, it's, and, and it's, it's, it's exhilarating and it's incredible because you know that if he falls from the swing, he'll fall to his death. And he's swinging back and forth, back and forth. And then on the other side, there's another guy swinging opposite of him, back and forth, back and forth. And then all of the sudden, the guy who's swinging on this side and he's he, he lets go of, of the swing and he's breathlessly hanging in midair in suspense, flying across the tent. With his arms stretched out. And then on the other side, out of nowhere, the other guy comes 
and he swings up and his arms are stressed out. And in a breathtaking moment, the, 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 the trapeze artist reaches out and he grabs the hands and the wrists of the other guy. And he swings and he pulls him to safety to the other side of the tent. He has to totally trust. He has to swing and then he has to let go. He has to take that leap of faith and he has to let go at some point knowing that he'll be caught. You know, and it's that same faith that God calls us to when it comes to believing in him. In Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 27, the Bible simply says that, that Moses saw what was invisible. And isn't the impossible always invisible? And because Moses was able to see what was invisible, he was able to believe and see God. It's belief that we carry with us, with prayer that makes all things possible. You know, I just love Moses and I, I, I love the fact that he picked up that rod because that was the same rod that he used in Exodus chapter seven and verse 12 when the sorcerer's uh, rods turned into snakes and Moses took his rod and his rod swallowed their snakes. That was the same rod Moses used in, Acts chapter, uh, in Exodus chapter seven and verse 20. And it was that same rod that he used for all of the other nine plagues in Egypt. It was that same rod. It was that same rod in Exodus chapter 14, that rod of faith, that rod of belief, that rod of trust in God that, that he had to learn from in Exodus chapter four, that he used in Exodus chapter 14 and verse 27. It was that same rod, that same staff, that when he touched the Red Sea with it, it parted. You see, God, God wants to take the, the rod that you're using, that rod of faith that you're using every day in your life and use it to apply belief to everything in your life. And then we learn in Exodus chapter 17, Moses is in the wilderness again and the people are, are crying for, for water and God tells Moses, hey, speak, you know, uh, hit the rock with your, your rod and Moses hits the rod, the rock with that rod and water springs up and the people's thirst are satisfied. Your rod of belief can satisfy the thirst of people. And then, you know, interestingly enough, it's that same rod in Exodus chapter 17. When God tells Moses, say to the rock, say to the rock, speak to the rock so that water would come up. And yet Moses on his own took his rod and he struck the rock twice. God had brought Moses to a point at the end of his life where he didn't need the rod anymore. He says, you, you, your faith is so great now, just speak to the rock. And Moses didn't trust God. And Moses took the rod and he hit the rock twice. And God was upset. And, and because he didn't trust the words of God, Moses was forbidden to go into the promised land. You know, God doesn't want your belief to just stay at the same place. He wants your belief to grow. Your, your belief right now may be at the rod level and you, you may need physical evidence in your life to see God working. Something that, that really isn't anything, but you may have to lean on something to have the faith that you need to have. But God wants you to get to a point where you don't need to lean on a rod anymore. God wants you to get to a point where you can just say the word and believe. You know, I was so inspired this last year by the story of Peter and Lori Jordan. You know, a year ago, we talked with them about what their dreams were in the kingdom, and Peter and Lori had this amazing dream. Hey, we want to be in the ministry. They're both uh, in their mid-50s, and they, they both had very professional jobs, and, and, and but, but God had put it on their hearts to be in the full-time ministry and to train in the full-time ministry. And they asked me about it and they said, hey, we really want to be in the full-time ministry and we want to come and, and lead and be a part of the ministry where you and Emma are in Chicago. And, and, and how much can you guys pay us so that we can be in the ministry? And I said, we can't pay you anything. We're, we're a small church and, and we're just starting out. 
we're, we're not going to be able to do that. But but we feel called, John. We feel called to be in the ministry. I said, well, we, we, we have put before the Lord. We want to plant the far south sector sometime this year. We're looking for a leader. And they said, we'll do it. We'll take the far south sector. We'll lead the sector. I said, but, but there's no job there. There's no money for it. We don't care. We're just going to start praying. And they started praying and fasting for over 50 days. The Jordans prayed that God would make it clear. And I started praying too. And I said, well, God, let allow Lori's job to transfer her here and allow, allow them to get job transfers to Chicago. And, and that's what I was planning. I'll never forget, I was talking to Peter and Lori and they said, that's not the way we want it. We, we don't want a job transfer. We want God to financially supply our needs. And I'll be honest with you, my, my faith was challenged by that. I thought, how is God going to do that? You both are in your mid-50s. Uh, we don't have a job for you in the ministry. What do you just think? Money's going to drop from the sky to support you? And Lori and Peter said, yes. God's going to provide. We're moving to Chicago. And so they they came out and, and they there's a, a, a couple that had a house and they wanted the house that this couple had. I'm like, well, why don't you pick a house that... that Nobody has that's vacant that somebody else doesn't own. And they said, no, we want that house. That's the house that God wants for us to have. And sure enough, that person decided to move out of the house and the house was available and they got that house. I said, well, how are you going to do with the loan? And you got to do this. You got, we, we're not worried about that. And they found this guy and he got him a loan immediately. And their loan was approved within a matter of weeks. And they got the house and they, and they said that we're moving. I said, well, how are you going to pay for all this? God will provide. All the while they're fasting and praying and asking, and believing, and, and, and I'm on the other hand trying to believe, trying to have faith, but wow, this, this is indeed the impossible, and so they, they get here to Chicago, and every week we talk and, and share, and they keep saying, God's going to provide, and it was incredible because Lori looked through her email, and there was an, e there was an email lost in her, her spam folder, and she was just by chance going through all the spams, clearing out her email. And she saw an email in there for a board position where it really wasn't a job. You just sit on this board and uh, you go to maybe four or five board meetings a year and they pay you a huge six figure salary just to sit on this board. And she didn't have any experience in banking, which is uh, the, what the board uh, position was for. Um, but she prayed and she believed and there were 80 candidates that they were sorting through. And she was a finalist. And she ended up and we started praying that she would be the very first one. They were going to bring two people on the board and we started praying that she would be number one. That was my prayer. And two or three weeks ago, Lori got the call that she was selected to be on this board. And God took and God through that will take care of their needs so that they can be in the ministry. You know, and I appreciate that faith. I appreciate that prayer. I appreciate that fasting and that sacrifice to move God. And God moved and God performed the impossible. And that's really what it's all about. God doing what he says he's going to do in our lives. You know, here the Bible says that you can tell a mountain to go and throw itself in the sea. I don't know about you, but mountains can't swim. <laughs> and so what God is saying, those, those mountains, those barriers, as we talked about earlier, that are in our lives, it's time to throw them into the sea in 2021 and believe like we've never believed before. Let's start by believing that all things are possible with God. And let's continue in our personal life and let's transfer that belief into God working into our lives by believing that nothing is impossible for us with God. You know, 2020 was an amazing year uh, in the PAC family of churches. You know, we're so thankful for how God has worked so powerfully in the Pacific Northwest. We're so excited to, at how God worked so powerfully in the Midwest churches. Uh, the Lord was able to allow us to plant the Minneapolis St. Paul Church last year, which was amazing. 
the Chicago church had a phenomenal 2020 in the middle of a pandemic. We started the year with 131 disciples. And by the end of the year, we were at 265 disciples in the Chicago church. I want to lift up the amazing and incredible Chicago church for being a church that does miracle in the PAC world sector, for being a world sector that believes nothing is impossible with God. You know, for Chicago for this year in 2021, we're so excited about all of our goals for 2021. We're committed to seeing God do the impossible in Chicago this year. We've got 10 goals in Chicago for this year. Goal number one is our growth goal. And we want to see every member in the Chicago church grow spiritually. You know, as a leader of this church, I feel, Emma and I feel like our number one responsibility is to make sure every disciple grows in their relationship with God. And our goal and our heart is to make sure that we preach and we teach and we train and we feed, feed the members of this church so that you're more faithful by the end of 2021 than you were when we started 2021 together. And we're so excited about that. Uh, we believe that we're going to go from 265 disciples this year to 400 disciples by the end of 2021. Our second goal is our goal for our women's ministry. We're so excited. We've got the most powerful group of women in the world. Our women's ministry is incredible. You know, I'm so thankful for my dear wife, Emma, and uh, just all of our associate women's ministry leaders and, and Sheila Turner and, and uh, Debbie Lamon, so thankful for all of our super regional uh, leader women as well that work together with them, Carrie Sue Adams, as well as Sparkle Boyer. The women have a goal this year to have 250 women at Women's Day. And the women's ministry is praying and planning that God will bless them with 80 women additions in 2021. What an incredible goal. I'm so excited about all the young women that are raising up in the Chicago church. Amazing young sisters rising on up in the leadership going into the ministry. We're very, very fortunate. Uh, also, we have goal number three is our missions goal. Uh, we plan on raising over $350,000 for missions this year. And this year, we'll just have the spring missions as we'll no longer be having an autumn mission uh, in the Chicago church. And God is going to meet our needs in that way. We believe in raising money to plant churches all over the world. Excitingly, in the Pac World sector, we're going to be planting this year St. Louis, Missouri. We're also going to be planting this year Boise, Idaho, out of Seattle. We're so excited about that. And then we just decided six months ago that we're going to be planting Detroit, Michigan. The gospel is going to the Motor City. Uh, in Detroit, Michigan this year. And so we need to raise money for that. We want to encourage all of our members to be sacrificial and generous in our spring uh, missions contribution as we raise money to plant churches literally around the world. And on the international front, just so that I say it, I believe there's 10 other churches that are going to be planted around the world in addition to the three uh, in the PAC world sector. Uh, we're excited about our campus ministry. We want to see our campus ministry grow to 70 students. We have campus ministries at Northwestern, DePaul, UIC, DuPage, Illinois Institute of Technology, the Art Institute, Morton College, Moody College, Triton College, Elmhurst University, and many other campuses where we have students uh, here in Chicago. We're also excited about our AMS ministry. We want to see our AMS ministry grow to 25 members. We had an incredible year last year. We want to really lift up Theo and Summer for the incredible job that they're doing. Uh, they're going to be appointed this next year as the AMS leaders for the entire PAC world sector. So we're so excited about the ministry that they're building and all that God is doing. Chicago is such an AMS town. We have so many talented disciples uh, that you've seen displayed, even in this conference, some of their talents and their gifts and, and how they're using their abilities to inspire us in God's kingdom. Also in 2021, we want to appoint four evangelists. Uh, we already know who they are and we're praying by faith. Uh, that, that they'll continue to do well, as well as four women's ministry leaders, three shepherding couples. Uh, we're, gonna, uh, we're so excited that uh, the Dawsons have been appointed as shepherds in our church as well today. The Dawsons are amazing. Uh, so one down, two more to go. 
We're also excited about having at least four marriages in our church this year. And of course, you know, uh, Danny just stole my daughter's hand and just got engaged to my dear daughter, Taylor, uh, got my permission. But, you know, I, I was inspired by how he went about it. You know, he, he asked her his he asked her for his hand at, at this incredible location in downtown. He made this little uh, rose flower of, uh, in a heart shape and had her walk up to this little rose flower and step inside the middle of the rose flower. You know, I, I thought I did a great job when I was asking Emma to be my wife, but th this just this just threw my little engagement to the to, to the side. But you know, so he had this little petal of roses in the shape of a heart. Had her step in it. In the backdrop was the botanical gardens of downtown Chicago. Big light show, lights glistening and emulating all over. The backdrop was the Chicago skyline. He pulled off his coat. He had on a tuxedo and a bow tie, and he dropped down on one knee and asked her. And of course, she said, "Yeah, how are you going to say no when you're standing in a in a a, a a rose heart deal there like he had done?" But but this is the way to declare your love. And you know, you other brothers that are gonna get engaged this year, the bar is way, way up here. Uh, but we're so excited that our sisters are treated so special, and that we value love and engagement as specialness, only in the kingdom of God. And it's so exciting because their relationship has been pure. They've never even kissed yet. They're saving their first kiss for their wedding day. Only in the kingdom of God is the impossible impossible. Is the impossible possible in the kingdom of God. And that's so exciting to see their love being declared in that way. Uh, also, we're so excited about our contribution. Thank you for all of our members. We had an incredibly successful uh, pledge drive um, the last week of the last week of uh, December. And uh, I want to thank all of you for raising your pledges. Uh, we've been able to hire 20 new interns to train and go on staff and, and, and rise up here in Chicago so that we could send them out all over, the, all over the world to preach the gospel. Thank you for your generosity. Your generosity translates into life. Your, your generosity is going to save souls. These are, these are young people who have given up their college educations and their degrees to go into the full-time ministry. They, they work for peanuts. They all work part-time jobs at, at Starbucks or DoorDash or, or uh, uh, Walmart. Or, but, but to free themselves up, and very often working the graveyard shift so that they can be available to do the ministry. I wanna thank every member of our church for your incredible generosity. We had our first contribution of the year just last Sunday on January 3rd. And we raised our pledge to 15,000. Uh, last year this time, our church was giving 7,500 a week. And this past Sunday, we gave over $15,200. You went over the pledge by 110%. Uh, we're thankful, we're grateful. Uh, we're gonna use this money to save souls. I wanna encourage all of you, um, God will bless your giving. And I want to just challenge us as a church. Let's make sure we give every week. You say, well, what, what if something happens and something bad happens? Give something. Make the decision that there'll never be a week in your spiritual life where you don't give something to God. And certainly things happen from time to time, uh, especially in the pandemic era. We, we lose our wages. But I, I want to challenge us to step out on faith. God sees even our two copper coins. And let's make sure every week as a disciple of Jesus, we give something to God. Why? Because every week God gives something to us. And so let's always give something back. As I mentioned earlier, just seeing our, our babies using their talents for God. You know how God feels when he gives you something and then you give something back to him? I know, you know, for, for the Christmas holidays and, and, and I gave my wife a gift and she took part of my gift and she went out and, and took part of that and gave some of that back to me. It just touched my heart so much. It showed me that, you know what? You mean more to me than I mean to me. And that's what we say to God when we give. When we, when we take what he's given to us and we, we give it back to him, it touches his heart. 
so much. And I believe God will open the floodgates for us when we have that kind of generosity. So let's every member of the PAC World Sector, let's every member of the Chicago Church make the decision in 2021, every week I'm giving something to God. I, I want to give my pledge. I want to give my tithe. I want to give what I've committed. I want to fulfill my vow. But if, if something happens that, that gets in the way of that, I'm going to always give something. Amen. And then number eight, uh, we're going to plant new regions in our church this year. Uh, I already mentioned the far south last year. This year, we're going to be planting three new regions. We now have 11 regions uh, in the Chicago church. This time next year, we're going to have 14 regions. We're going to plant the West Central region and the West Super region. Next year, we're going to plant two regions in downtown, the downtown West region and the downtown Pilsen region. We're also excited about number nine, ICCM. We want to get more people in ICCM. Our movement has the most uh, educated disciples that, that I've ever been a part of. Uh, ICCM is so incredible. And we're so excited about the, the, the biblical knowledge and teaching. It's one thing to have the heart. It's another thing to know your Bible and know how to use it. And our ICCM students uh, are amazing. Uh, we want to make a, a goal to enroll at least two master's students this year. We've already in Chicago have four students that are going to be joining the master's program. So we've already doubled that goal. And then uh, one doctorate student, and uh, I'm that doctorate student this year. Uh, I just finished writing my book, and uh, God willing, I'll be receiving my doctorate degree this August. Pray for me that I can make it to the end. I believe, amen. Uh, but we're almost there, so we should blow out our ICCM goals. And then finally, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to be planting three churches this year. Uh, just this group of us uh, here in the pack that are on this Zoom call. We're going to plant three cities. We're going to send a church to Boise. We're going to send a church to St. Louis. We're going to send a church to Detroit so that the residents in these areas have an opportunity to hear the gospel. Truly, God is doing miracles through us. God is doing the impossible through us. The word is being preached on campuses all around the Midwest, the Pacific Northwest and Canada. God is doing incredible things. We're going to look back one day and we're going to be blown away by how God has used our lives. I'd like to close on out in Jeremiah chapter 32. Jeremiah chapter 32. This is a prayer that Jeremiah shared with the Lord, and it's a prayer that I'd like to put before us today. Jeremiah chapter 17, it says, All sovereign Lord, you have made the heavens and the earth by your great power and outstretched arm. Nothing is too hard for you. You show love to thousands, but bring to punishment for the parents' sins into the laps of their children after them. Great and mighty God, whose name is Lord Almighty. Great are your purposes, mighty are your deeds, for your eyes are open to the ways of all mankind. You reward each person according to their conduct as their deeds deserve. And truly as Jeremiah prayed here in this passage, just like the outstretched arms of the, tra of the trapeze artist, God's arms are stretched out. They're stretched out and God is, 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 is ready to, to bless us in incredible ways. That there's nothing that's too hard for God to do. In fact, if you can believe it, you can receive it. And I want to challenge us this year to believe like we've never believed before. To believe in miracles. To believe that God will allow us to cast those mountains into the sea that hold us back in our spiritual lives. To believe that, 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 that whatever we pick up will turn into a rod of faith. And that at some point that rod of faith that we lean on and that we hold on to will, will grow to the point where we will have the faith that we can just speak the words and God will work in an incredible way. 
Truly 2021 is going to be an unbelievable year in the pack world sector. And to God be all the glory. And the church said, Amen. Well, guys, it's been an incredible day and really a great close to a phenomenal conference, the first ever Northern American Missions Conference. You know, I really think that John's sermon has highlighted the I believe mentality. I mean, these are the two most important words you can say in your entire life. And this is what God wants to hear us declare. I believe. And when we believe, and we have that in our hands to share with others, and we have the belief in our hearts to help ourselves, we know that God can move mountains, God can do the impossible. This is so incredible. Thank you, John, for an amazing lesson. We are inspired to believe that absolutely nothing is impossible with God. Even the word itself says, I'm possible. And it's so amazing that God doesn't do things in an ordinary way. He's always extraordinary. And we need to stop running from what is possible and take hold of it with God. It's so incredible that this comes full circle all the way down to little old us, the little ants in comparison to God, that even nothing is impossible for us with God. All things are possible for those who believe. And that is a promise for you, and that is a promise for me. I love you so much. Amen. Well, here's what we got to do, guys. We are the pack world sector, and it's time for us to take a leap of faith. I think it's one thing to step out on a limb. It's one thing to stretch our faith, but it's time to take a leap of faith. Let's see what God can do through us. My challenge to all of us is pray as if you've already attained what God's given you. Pray as if you already know what the outcome of 2021 is going to be like. Pray as if you know the size of the mountain and you know God is going to take it and throw it into the sea. Let's go out there in 2021 and let's believe with all of our hearts, all of our soul, all of our mind, all of our strength that God can do it. Amen. And to God be all the glory. Amen. Johannesburg, Bombay, and Hong Kong, and LA, the world. United we stood, but divided we fell. But Satan unleashed the hounds of hell. Uh They came from everywhere to make war against the kingdom of the air. The spirit of the Lord would lead the way. The devil knew that we were here to stay. Uh
sit and strut back We're all lost heart And like a lion he began to tear us apart But in Portland they refused to give up the dream To reach the whole wide world with that living stream They kept making disciples in the name of the sun And restoration led to revolution uh Miami and Kinshasa is Sao Paulo. College or team. Now, folks in Minnesota are in distress, but so today we're sending out Minneapolis. Uh huh. Sing and say, We're going to sing. 